A Ukrainian attack at Bakhmut highlighted an issue in the Russian military that if they don't fix, could be a major problem for them in the coming months. Overnight, news came out that Ukraine's 3rd Assault Brigade kicked off a localized counterattack southwest of Bakhmut that resulted in their taking back of some territory and forcing Russian troops to flee. Now, given that this is very recent information, it's hard to take Ukraine's word and just run with it. There are, however, Russian sources who have also commented on this event, calling out some of the issues that it brought to light. For starters, before we get into the details, I want to be clear that this was, all things considered, a relatively minor change in territorial control. If we look at the difference between these two maps from Deep State Map, you can see that the lines shift a bit, representing around three square kilometers of territory retaken by Ukraine. Additionally, there does appear to be some minor Ukrainian pushes in Bakhmut itself on the north and northeast side of the city. But in this event, it's not the territory gained or the number of casualties or prisoners taken, which on that front, I've seen reports of a lot, but nothing concrete enough to report. The big item here is how Russian forces appear to have collapsed in this small sector. First, we'll look at some comments by Yevgeny Prigozhin, the leader of the Wagner Group. And by the way, that whole we're not getting ammo, so we're leaving Bakhmut on May 10th. Just kidding, we got ammo. Has now reverted again with Prigozhin putting out a video yesterday, May 9th, saying that they're still not getting the necessary ammo and repeated his threat that Wagner will have to leave Bakhmut if it's not resolved. And honestly, I don't see that drama resolving itself anytime soon. Anyways, Prigozhin put out another video saying that Russian fighters were running because the 72nd Brigade, a Russian unit, messed up, resulting in the loss of three square kilometers of territory and upwards of 500 people killed. For a little more context, Russian military blogger Anastasia Kashavarova put out a long thread on Telegram saying that, quote, the Wagners withdrew from that flank because they had a breakthrough elsewhere, and the 72nd Brigade did not know this. The 72nd had artillery there, but there was no assault forces, and that's where the Ukrainians came in, end quote. She added that in the midst of all this reporting, talking to folks in Wagner and the Russian Ministry of Defense, that she uncovered that nobody is really working together, adding, quote, Wagner, they say, tried to contact the 72nd, who did not want to interact. The 72nd has a ban on working with Wagner from the Ministry of Defense, end quote. I'm very interested in hearing more about this ban of Russian Ministry of Defense forces working with Wagner. I haven't heard much about that at all, but if that's the case, the lack of communication between units goes well beyond just the normal chaos of the battlefield. She wraps up by saying that regular Russian army units are wondering where the LPR and DPR forces are, and those forces are wondering where the Russian army is. That Wagner is stealing tanks from other units, and then those units supposedly crushed a Wagner pickup truck. Military police are stealing humanitarian aid. Customs aren't letting drones through to the front. And even the LPR and DPR forces are both at odds with each other. So again, the major item here isn't the strip of land that Ukraine captured. It's getting a peek inside Russian command and control at the front. Rather than one unified force, it sounds like every variation in command comes with a deep rift between organizations. Look, it's already hard enough trying to tie in your lines with a sister battalion that you've worked with before and falls under the same commander, but what's described here is a recipe for disaster. For Russia, that is. For Ukraine, this sort of division and chaos is precisely how a few breakthroughs in the line could lead to a major advance into occupied territories. Shift it over to Moscow for a minute. On May 9th, Russia held their annual Victory Day celebration commemorating the Allied defeat of Nazi Germany in World War II. Over time, this has grown into a pretty serious event with just a never-ending parade of military equipment, both old and new, rolling through Moscow. But this year, it was a little bit different. Rather than showing off their new T-14 Armada tanks backed by 10 to 20 T-90s and T-72s, this year, there is just one lone T-34-85. That's it. Just one. Also, no flyover and a total of 51 vehicles in the entire parade. By comparison, last year there were 131 vehicles, and the year before that, over 200. On top of that, there was no VDV or Russian airborne equipment, hardly any infantry fighting vehicles, and no short-range surface-to-air missiles. That's a very noticeable change, and it's led to a lot of speculation. The easiest one to jump to here is that Russia doesn't have any more vehicles left, that they're all deployed at the front or destroyed. Now, I do think the war and ongoing losses play into what we saw, but I'm not fully on board with saying that the vehicles simply don't exist or aren't available. We're talking about 10 to 20 tanks here in a country where it's estimated at times to have had more than 10,000. And this is a parade. It's not like they needed to be up to combat readiness levels. They just have to drive without breaking down. And I'm certain that Russia could scrape together a dozen tanks that are being used in training, still being upgraded in warehouses, or deployed elsewhere outside of Ukraine. 
to me, this looks like Putin signaling to the Russian people that they're putting everything they have into the war and not holding back equipment for parades, which is a bit of a difference from last year where it came across more as showing that even though the war was raging, Russia still had so much capacity that a full parade of military equipment was really no big deal. Again, this is speculation on my part, but I think that helps explain the big swing from one year to the next. On the other hand, the parade did go on and they did showcase plenty of equipment that's being used in the war. I mean, S-400s, Iskanders, Boomerang IFVs, Tigers, and MRAPs all made an appearance. Either way, whether you think it's due to an overall lack of equipment or intended to send a message to the Russian people that the war is being prioritized over the parade, it was a pretty underwhelming event compared to recent years. Back over to the battlefields of Ukraine, I wanted to talk briefly through some of the Russian defensive positions. Pasi Peroinen, apologies for the pronunciation there, uh, put together this great breakdown of Russian defenses south of Zaporozhye, highlighted here on this map. Every image and map from here on out is his work that he put together on Twitter. Go give him a follow. I'm just aiming to highlight and share the work that he did and add a little bit of commentary. Now, at a high level, he breaks down the defensive lines into six distinct zones. Zone 1 is the first 3 to 4 kilometers, essentially the front lines, and is made up mostly of squad and platoon-sized fighting positions, as well as a handful of company strong points. Zone 2 is the next 2 to 3 kilometers, the first major defensive belt, which includes mostly company-sized strong points connected with extensive trench networks. Zone 3 is 4 to 5 kilometers deep, where the majority of Russian artillery is emplaced and where their mechanized reserve is held. So this is an area where mechanized forces can maneuver relatively freely in order to mass at the point of a breakthrough of zones one or two. Zone four is where we really start to see what we've come to expect of some of these Russian defensive positions. This is the zone filled with anti-tank ditches and dragon's teeth anti-tank obstacles. And while you can't see them from above, they're also likely minefields scattered all throughout this zone. So in satellite imagery, if there's any open field that looks like it would be great for tanks to drive through, best guess, it's full of mines. Finally, we have zone five and six, which he characterizes as fallback defensive positions behind the main defensive zones of three and four. Think defense in depth here. If the main line is breached, move back to prepared defensive positions and force the enemy to continue pressing into the kill zone. The major difference between zones five and six here is that while five is generally still in line with the front, six is what we might call more of an Alamo position, last stand. Few thoughts here. And first, go give this gentleman a follow on Twitter because he's doing some awesome work. Second, it's wild that we can see this with commercial satellite imagery. And I've said it before, but if this is what's available off the shelf, imagine what NATO is putting together in some of these areas. Lastly, this is a focused study on a small sector south of Zaporozhye and should not be understood as uniform all across the front. We've seen a lot of variation in how Russian units operate, and while there likely are some similarities from one sector to another, I'm doubtful this is how it looks all across the south and east of Ukraine. Russia has made a lot of mistakes in this war, but these defensive positions, at least at a high level, appear to be pretty solid. It looks like they took those lessons learned from Kharkiv last fall and are implementing them in preparation for the expected Ukrainian counteroffensive. And we'll have to wait and see if Ukraine works on avoiding these or taking them head on. 